Um, so today it's my pleasure to talk about the Small Images Exhibition and really more invite you to talk about the Small Images Exhibition. Um, to start, I want to talk about the process of jurying and how jurying and curating are related but separate processes. So this show is a juried exhibition. And for those of you who submitted, you know what this particular process is like. For those of you who are not artists and who have not submitted or you have not yet submitted to a juried exhibition, um, just to let you know, there are um, this type of show. There's a call that goes out. Artists are invited to participate. And you um, drop off your work. In this case, you drop off your work in person which is something that's a little unusual about this show, especially in this day and age where the possibility for a digital submission is really quite real. Um, so you drop off your, your work in person. And um, we have a very limited window for that. So it's 9 to 3 on a Saturday before the show opens. The juror, in this case this year me, makes a decision for in the four hours immediately after that um, submission. And the announcement is made at 4.30. So from 9 to 12, the artwork is dropped off. From 12 to 4, the juror makes the decision. At 4.30, the artists come back and find out whether or not they're in the show. So this is a very speedy process. Not all juried shows are quite so speedy. right? Some of them are submitted by slide or by, dig or by digital format so that there's more time to consider. Um, but typically, it's a fast response. It's a, um, it can be an individual, as it was this time with me, or it could be a, a panel of judges who confer with each other. Um, and I've certainly been on both types of panels. And this is different than a curated exhibition in which a curator might work over a period of time, over, over a year or more, with a group of artists or a single artist to cultivate and plan a show that goes around a theme or who highlights a certain artist's body of work. Um, so this, this is, as I think about it, you know, it's a gut check. Right. This is me in a room with 281 works were submitted this time, responding to those works. So what you see here, right? What you see here is my conversation with the 137 artists who submitted work. You know, my gut response. And in this case, because of the nature of our submission, because it is a physical submission, it's also primarily regional artists. So this is my first conversation with the artists of this region. Um, it won't be my last conversation. It won't be the only conversation. And you know, if I jury this show next year, it could look totally different. I won't jury this show next year because that would be weird. <laughs> but if I were to, it would look totally different, right? It would be a different conversation and potentially with a different group of artists, right? Because we'll have new artists coming in. Some of the artists will be moving out, so there'll be this kind of ongoing conversation. So I encourage you, when you look at this particular exhibition, to think about it as a conversation that happened between me and these artists on Saturday, September 29th, from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m., because that's what this is, right? This is not a studied, curated exhibition. There isn't a thematic connection between all of these works. It's me really looking at 280 artworks and really thinking which ones are talking to me. You know, which ones am I engaging with? Which ones are catching my attention? Why are they catching my attention? And when I thought about this process, right, because it really is a response to the work. I'm not applying theory to the work. I'm not putting it in historical context. I'm directly responding to the work itself. It made me think about a um, technique developed at the Museum of Modern Art by Philip Yenowin and Abigail Hausen in the 90s called the Visual Thinking Strategies. And this has been under, uh, is a widely applied technique for talking about art and working with groups, many groups who are not always experienced in talking about art, to engage with the piece, to engage with an individual object. So I hope you'll humor me today, and we'll try it out, OK? <coughs> Um, visual thinking strategies literally has three questions. And those are the questions that we're going to work with. And the three questions are, what do you see in this piece? And what makes you say or think that about the piece? What is it that you see? What is it that you see? What's actually in the piece that makes you say that? So again, we're thinking about what is in the piece. What has the artist given us? in the piece right? that we're thinking about. What makes us say that? And then, because we're fortunate enough to be working as a group to think about these pieces, 
what more can we find? Either, you know, the first person who's engaging with the piece, or maybe someone else sees something else that we can add to that conversation. And together, we can build an understanding of the piece and parse out that conversation with the artist, okay? So, um, as a gut check amongst you, I'm going to ask everybody to go stand next to the piece that talks the loudest to them. Now, you might love this piece. You might hate this piece. You might just really have a big question about this piece. But this is going to help me see if there's any couple of pieces in the room that are talking loudly to the whole group, OK? Because I'm curious to see if that's true. And also, it helps us narrow down what we might talk, to, talk about today. So if you would take a chance and stand next to the piece that's talking the loudest to you today. And it could be something you really like. It could be something you really hate. It could be something that you just have a really big question about. <clears throat> yeah, which ones are you standing next to? OK, since the pieces are small, it's not always going to be obvious to me where people are standing. So which one are you standing next to? This piece? And you're also there. Which one are you standing next to? This one? OK, great. Are you guys over both with Frank's pieces? And you're with Virginia's piece? One of Frank's. One of Frank's? Which ones are you guys with? You're with the I'm house? Standing with the house. Masonite. House. Table. You're with Masonite house. Oh, you're looking at the sake set? Yeah. Great. OK, great. Which piece are you standing with? Oh, that one. Great. You guys are standing with these? Great. Which one are you standing with? That painting? This, you're standing with this one? Terry, oh, right. I knew that. You already told me that one. <laughs> Great. Oh, and with the prickly pod. Great. Oh, and you're over here. OK. Very interesting. OK. Great. Hmm. Well, I'm going to start with where I see a few clusters. And then we're going to move around to a few other pieces as well. OK. So the first piece I want to start with is over here near Colleen. If everybody wants to come closer so that we can see this, this piece is by Deborah Walsh. So remember, the first question is, what do you see in this picture? You know, what's going on in this picture? It may be a narrative. It might be something technical that you see going on. So what's going on in this picture? Right, that's the first question. Colleen, do you? Oh, hey. oh, you think it's a story? Yeah, Thanks, Terry. Kind of I'm going to ask Colleen first, since she was one of the people over here. Well, um, the first thing that attracted me to it was the wax. The wax. The encaustic. And, so. And the the palette, the, the black and white, and the subdued colors. Really so what you here. see is a, the surface, surface, right? We really respond to this surface. We also respond to this really limited palette. Right? Those are two things that we really notice immediately about this piece. Definitely. Were you at this piece too? Mm -hmm. and why did, what did you see in this piece? Um, I like the juxtaposition of architecture and nature. Oh, and what makes you, s so right, now we're going to do this. Right? What makes you say that? Right? What, what do you see that makes you I say that? I this square as a piece of art. And that window uh -huh. gives me that confidence to say, I think it's architecture. Right, right. So you very, because the artist is giving us, right, some conversation, recognizable symbols that we can see. So we see this, this window or a window-like form, and then we see these um, black forms that we might read as. Yeah, I'm reading it as uh, deciduous trees. Right, yeah. so we, we see these kind of bare. And also, I think it's really important, right, these are deciduous trees, right? These are barren mm -hmm. trees. This is not a lush mm -hmm. landscape. Mm -hmm. Right, which is also we talk about when we talk about this, co this color scheme. Right, this isn't this lush landscape. This is a barren landscape. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's a picture of a drawing. Oh. Like a torn piece of paper with mm -hmm. architecture right. on it. So, than right. So right. Picture of a house. Right. So so it's a right, and this is interesting. Right, this is kind of self-referential. Right, it looks like a picture of a drawing. Right, we see a drawing within a drawing, and what it makes us say that. Right, we see this kind of structural layering, right? So we talk about this kind of drawing within a drawing, right? Definitely. I think story is intense. Because the intensity in that room, you can imagine saying, but the color is so neutral. So I think this artist is genius. <laughs> <laughs> but but what makes window, you... Window, right. that window, I have a psychic problem. I can 
not sure what one said. <laughs> but Terry, <laughs> well, yeah, Terry, what makes you think it's intense? What intense. makes you what makes you say intense? Yeah. This is a story. It's a story. So you really I mean, feel the narrative, right? Uh, and I think that's true. I think right. Yeah. We all really respond. There's a Some narrative here that we can system. respond to for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> what do you see in it? What else can we find? Well, I think it's a beautiful piece. It's well worth one of the things about a show like this, especially a small images show, it really requires, and it's really exciting, right? One of the things that de is demanded by the virtue of this show specifically, right, a small images show, is that you as the viewer have to get right up on the piece, right? You, and so it really is a truly a personal dialogue between you and the artist. That This show only works if you take the time to come up to each piece. If we stand back in this room, you can see what I did as a design of the show, right? Which is okay. But if you want to see the work, this show really requires that you come up to it. And there's something immediate about that kind of relationship as well. I didn't know what you mentioned, but I find it immediately without spending too much time with it uh, because of this emphatic vertical. Mm. Uh, that is the vertical time. Right. There is, right. And there's, it's, it's really exciting. There's a variety of lines, right, that you have this, the very harsh, sharp line of this kind of window figure and then these more um, organic lines and that contrast between those is really engaging, implied right? Forest. Right. And this implied forest, absolutely. Great. Can, can you repeat, like, the question is, what are we seeing? What so, what's going on in this picture? Right. What so makes you say that? And then what more can we find? So it's curious because I am thinking that if we ask what, what's going on in the piece, then it's truly visual. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's not giving any content safe from the title, because when you read the title we get new information about it. Right. So everybody's gonna see read it differently. Right. And by the way, just so you guys know, I very purposely chose not to look at titles or names um, when I, uh, the, the, the tags, everybody's tags were fixed to the back of the piece. And I made a very conscious decision when I um, chose the artworks not to look at names or titles because I just decided that would help me be as neutral as possible. I hadn't met very many people yet, but I definitely, of the few people who I have met, had met at that point, I didn't know their artwork. Um, and I had very been specific. Anybody who'd come to ask me questions, I'm like, I don't want to see it. Don't bring it in here. I don't want to talk about it. So, um, so reading this out of context is true to the experience that I had as juror. Okay. May I say something? Yes. In the other, in the, this lady was quite nice. <laughs> right. And I think that's actually part of the fun yeah. of a show like this too, because you are coming in person, and all of your fellow artists are standing in line, and you do get to see each other's work. So, as you can imagine, a lot of people have opinions about which pieces should have gotten accepted, which are probably not the same as my opinion, which is, of course, entirely natural and totally. Fine. Yes. I think what's really exciting about visual is that there is no right or wrong. No. Right. And of course, you can, there are other ways to analyze artwork, of course. I could apply uh, a theoretical framework to this. I could put this in historical context. It's not that you can't do that, and that would be inappropriate. Of course, it is entirely. But um, I felt that for today, given the nature of the jury process, and especially my jury process in this show, that this visual thinking strategy is a very um, true reflection of that process. Um, so um, another cluster I noticed was with Frank uh, Krifka's pieces. Um, so Frank's uh, selectors over here, did you both choose eye candy or did one choose eye candy and one choose this piece? We, chose, we both chose eye candy. Right? Okay, yeah. so we're looking at this piece. We're looking at this piece. And um, so remember the first question is what's going on in this picture? So what's going on in this picture? Um, so I thought this getting unwrapped. Okay, and what makes you say that? It's just like really realistic. Right, so, so there's pretty like literal 
illustration here, right, so that we can really recognize this lollipop. We recognize the wrapper. Okay, what more do we see? It's interesting, you asked that question because I chose it and I see before. The words that come to my mind is that something is being held. And mm. I kind of see the dichotomy of the, some part of the dichotomy I feel from the piece, you know. Right, right. So, you're right, again, and we're looking at this, what, what's, something's being held. So we see the suggestion, right, that this, this object that we're experiencing as a, as a real object is being held to the wall by the tape. Right? This is, you know, right, this experience, right. What more can we find in this piece, yeah? Well, I think it's interesting because it's being held up, but is it being held up as something <laughs> that's wonderful or is it being held away from us, like right. taped away in some place that you can't get to it mm -hmm. so you're not tempted. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I mean, it has kind of a, a funny narrative to it. Right. You know, why is it being taped up? Right, so we, we do have to ask the question, you know, why this object? Why is it being taped to this wall, you know? Why is it being framed? Right, and I think in this piece, my read is that the frame is something I'm really thinking about, right? I can't avoid the frame. I'm looking at the frame, which seems like very much part of the piece in this case. Yeah, what, what more do you? Um, I didn't notice it being close to it, but far away, it gives me a feeling of a person. Huh. Right? Yeah. So you really feel this, right? You see this hand and yeah, arms, right? You can I see this. I build on that because when I look at it sort of abstractly, I see a crucifixion. Mm. Right. And right. And where do we get that from, right? This, this is a shared symbol in our culture, right? We recognize this cross, and especially if we start to read this figuratively. So that, you know, this is where this comes from, right? How do we get that? What else do you see? What else can we find? Well, just the trickery of the tape in that you, it looks like it's coming out toward you. Right. Then is it, and you have to lean closer to examine. Right. Is it chocolate, or is it just a lollipop? Right. Or a drawing of a lollipop. Right. With the stick really taped to the canvas. Right. I, I find that the titles help me a lot in mm -hmm. the piece. Frequently I find they're essential. And in this case, it's eye candy, so he's trying to tell us something about that. But I, I, I agree with you. I, I think it's being held away from us. <laughs> That's <not laughs> okay. And it's, it's tempting us. Right. Though it's interesting for me when I read them in context with each other, these two pieces in context with each other, then it becomes almost like an artist's clipboard to me, right? Because then I'm just reading it like my own studio practice where I start taping things on the wall that I'm interested in, that I'm thinking about, so that I read this as like, oh, this is my, my work board, um, which is not true, again, and this is interesting, right? How does a piece operate in conjunction with another? Because when you read this alone, I think we read it really differently than if I read them in conjunction with each other, where I just say, oh, this is something that he's doing over and over again. What is he doing? Is this always the same surface? You know, right? What are these weird little things that he's collecting? You know? Yeah. You did that with a couple of the uh, artists. You saw it in the context of the book. Yes, no, and that was very, I, I definitely had a long conversation with myself about, you know, should I only choose one piece per artist? You know, is that really important? Or um, do the pieces speak so strongly to each other? And even though I know, like, for instance, about Connie's work that these um, two people aren't necessarily in relationship to each other as so much as in a relationship in a, la in a larger project, the way that those two pieces positioned to each other was really, they were laid down on the table that way, not by me. Um, and I couldn't get away from them talking to each other. Like they had to like stay together. I, I did, you know, consider, oh, maybe I'll just put this one piece in, but I could never, the idea that they wouldn't be talking to each other just it didn't make any sense to me. So I definitely, um, continually uh, went back to there were certain pieces I really wanted to see in context with each other. I also think that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting her name, who did the uh, Lee Like those really would not accept And she saw them as but I absolutely understood that as a Right. Right. No. You made that. You made that choice 
several times, but I would guess that there were many Oh, and there were. So you did not make that. Of course, there were definitely many occasions in which, or, or even in a case where, I'm trying to find one that's a good example, that there were three, actually, a, a three or four once, there were three. It actually, and when you read the titles, you're like, oops, I probably blew that entirely because they're called like, hear no evil, see no evil, uh, say no evil, and I only chose two of the three. Um, <laughs> but I didn't read the titles. <laughs> and so, um, but there were three in that case. Um, so, yes. I, I chose him. finding as the juror and as the sort of the curator that they're formal. Oh, they're very and formal. And then other times they're conceptual or yes. sort of based on the content. And here, in these, in this suite of four um, works, it seems like it's both. Uh, right. And I think that's very true. I think, though, of course, you also see, right now you're seeing the show as I, remember, I'm, I'm in the jack of all trades here. So I also was the exhibit designer. So you're also seeing it after I, then I sat with it for a week and put it in order, right? Thought about which pieces, not only between art, within an artist's body of work, but between artist bodies of work might um, be engaged with each other. And honestly, a show like this, because it is so disparate in terms of media and content, and that the only thing that's really holding the show together is this intimacy of size, that I did make a lot of formal decisions um, in my exhibition design, right? That I made a lot of just, I think these pieces are going to sit well physically next to each other, because that's kind of the constraint of this part of the show. So I was thinking about it quite formally uh, when I designed the show. But I also made decisions um, I, I, you know, being someone who knew, I knew I was also going to be the exhibition design designer, um, that I definitely thought about how pieces would look in the gallery as I was jurying. I definitely knew that they would be coming into this space, and I was definitely thinking about um, sometimes when you do two pieces together, they have a little more weight. And so I also knew that, like, sometimes having a quiet, separate piece, but also having two together was going to allow for a variety of, uh, of uh, kind of visual uh, weight around the room, and that was important to me. And I do treat exhibition design, I was trained as a studio artist, and I do treat exhibition design absolutely like I treat any other artwork. I think about it, so, absolutely. So I actually want to try um, talking, um, using one of our, uh, a, a piece that I didn't see anybody choose, um, also, just because I want to see um, how you all respond to it. So I'd love to um, ask you to respond to Marlene's piece. So I'm going to start again. Is what do you see? You know, what, what, what's going on in this picture? Green. Green. <laughs> right. What makes you say that? <laughs> right? Springtime. <laughs> springtime, maybe, right? Because we, green might be associated with spring. So we see green. Right. What else do we see? What else? What is going on in this picture? I've known Marlene's work prior to this uh, more physical work, mm. and the thing that stands out for me is texture. Mm, texture. And that because she did digital things before, right. and there was lacking in her. Right. You know, the layered, uh, layered thinking. Right. And I really like you use the word physical, right? And at the, I think this is very physical. Right? And that's because we see this surface, right, has a really tangible sense, right? We really, this is not flattened at all. This has it literal texture. It's built off. It's coming out. It has movement. It has movement. And what makes it have movement? Uh, the depth. The depth, right? So it has movement going in. I also think it has movement going this way, right, because of these Maybe types of lines, the right? The right, these kinds of lines suggest movement left to right as well, though not a necessarily a direct movement, kind of a water-like movement, a fluid. a fluid movement, right? Right. What else do you see? Is there, like, I see a lot of depth, but is there a single vanishing point? No. No. It's up more it than all over. It is maybe from here, so I have to I feel like it res 
recedes a bit, sort of in the center of the frame this, of reference. Yeah, like both coming in like but this. But it is relatively sort of um, flattened, like the right. relationship of these forms to each other are within the same scale. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't we don't get a sense that like this is closer to us than mm -hmm. maybe this or something. Right, and you see how Brian is reading that? Do you see that? Right, so he's saying, because of scale, I can read that I'm not, uh, that I'm always equidistant, right. right, from these objects. I'm not, even though they're abstracted objects, I'm always equidistant from these. So maybe I'm in a kind of bird's eye view all the way out here. I'm not standing looking at it, but I'm all the way out here always. Right, yeah. It may have yeah. been just, I'm, I'm certain it was probably just happenstance, but she has this one kind of bright little spot, and mm. when you get back, it looks like it could be a vortex. Of uh -huh. <laughs> right, but, but I think, right, yeah. and it ultimately, right, it's what the artist put out here. So what we're doing today, and again, this is one way of reading a piece, is reading what's here, right? We're reading what's here. So, you know, that's interesting, right? How does that one bright center affect how we read a piece. I think that's really interesting, right? I know for me, I'm really responding to the undercolor. I really think that this color is really interesting. I think about rust. I think about earth. I think about, you know, and especially because it's, it's so scraped. It, you know, like, I just am really interested in, like, you know, this kind of excavation, right, that we're seeing, right? This is another artist whose title, because we'll, I'll tell you the title. I think in some ways, right, it kind of, I was really glad I didn't see the title first. <laughs> this title is Treasure Islands, um, which, I, you know, I think I see it and I understand it s still, right, that we, maybe we are looking at this topical graphical map, maybe we are seeing the earth, but I, I like it even better when I experience this excavation on its own, right, where I don't have to say, oh, it's the island. Right? I, I like it even better. And again, from a during point of view, I responded really just viscerally to the surface. The surface was really exciting and interesting to me. You bring up a point that's kind of an aside. I've worked for a long time to, uh, on titles because they can either be way too specific and take people off point, mm -hmm. or just what you're referring to, it, it takes the pleasure out of doing it if the mm -hmm. title's too corny, misses the point, it doesn't connect with Right, no, and it's incredibly difficult, right, yeah. to think about that. And I think, for instance, I actually felt like your title when I read them, I thought that actually deepened my understanding of that piece, yeah. um, which is facing 60 and then the name of each subject. Um, but I don't think that that's always true, and I think it's a big. T you're actually somebody. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about titles, because you actually really think about titles in a very integrated way with your work. Well, I guess I just have a question um, about that, because I'm interested in that. Like yeah. the title, do you see the title as being adjacent to the piece, like like it's another piece unto itself, similar to this gentleman's work, the framed. Right. Trump boy mm -hmm. um, paintings that they're two unique images that um, complement. I so hope that that's true. I don't know that all artists successfully do that. I think I am not somebody who thinks every piece should be untitled. That's, that is not my goal in life when I say that sometimes a piece, sometimes a title um, flattens my experience of a piece. Mm -hmm. Because I actually think that a title could, as you say, function as a separate piece and actually invite a deeper uh, and uh, understanding or invite a tangent. So, for instance, um, I've been looking at Brian's work recently and getting ready. Brian has a solo show coming up next. And so I've had the pleasure of looking at Brian's work recently. And Brian um, will often um, have a title which makes a re another reference that might not even be physically in the work, but it makes another uh, reference which then suggests, oh, I should look at that too. You know, when I'm trying to understand this piece, not only am I going to look what's in the piece, but I'm going to add this other reference into the piece, which I think is, yeah. is can be really exciting. Um, I'm wondering, too, just like when you mentioned literalism, like that idea of like, you know that within the piece itself there isn't this kind of literalism, that there's something more mm -hmm. than more a, a painting of an apple. Like it's an right. apple, it's representing an apple, but there's something more that you're sensing in right. the work. 
but then the title is Apple. That kind of phenomenon of like, it kind of, it's almost like a humorous gesture of like, well, we all know it's an apple. that it's not an apple, you know, but right. here we it are is. left with this title that is literal. Right. But because of its literalism, it emphasizes what's not more. true. Right. Well, I the, think that it, that's true. It goes, it has to play with the piece and your kind of body of work thinking mm -hmm. because, it, you know, you may hit on it once and that little innuendo of it's so obvious that's exactly what I mean that you know that there's another story by the viewer to participate in taking down all those layers and the, so but the title for me is just it, it's, it adds to the piece it doesn't necessarily it kind of knits the idea hopefully together mm. so. No, I think it's I think it's one of the great struggles. I see a lot of artists struggle with this issue, um, so I don't, and I don't think, know that there's a single answer to that. Um, but I, I am I'm personally excited when the when a title um, does allow some extension of the piece um, in some way. Okay, so now Kit, if you won't uh, mind too much, um, I'd like to look at this piece. I had a number of people who chose this piece. And so the first question is, what's going on in this piece? Right? We can do this with a three-dimensional object as well as with a two-dimensional object. So what's going on in this piece? You want to hurt my feelings. I know. <laughs> So right, we're responding to the tape and our right shared knowledge of this tape, right? What does this tape mean, it's right? As a symbol, it doesn't feel like, so. Actually, I think this very sturdy structure, right? So that I think that's interesting. This conf this conflict to this tape holding it together when actually when we look at this, it's clear structurally. It doesn't really need the tape right now, at least. It like seems. it might need the tape, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't currently need the tape, right? <laughs> What, what do you see? What I think is kind of cool is it, is it kind of forces you to have an outside perspective, but mm. you can't try and connect with people really because there's no door mm. or anything right. like this. So, offering right, so entrance. one thing that's going on is that there's no door, there's no entrance to this structure, right? We're exclusively on the outside of this structure. I think it's a very interesting, right, you know, right? You read this, we're exclusively on the outside, right? And we recognize this, right, this structure as a, as a something that we all recognize as house, right? This is kind of a very literal house. Yeah. It seems to me when you go from the two-dimensional work to this, I, I, it seems really strong. So I, I first thought it was, that it was built, you know, and that mm. relates not only to the image of house, but it, that it's a three-dimensional work. And, right. And it's a different process. Right. And I think this is really true, right? That we really, one of the things about each process is that we respond to, like when you, we hear a lot of people talk about this wax surface, right? I mean, we do have this very uh, direct response to the material, to the technique, so that, that this, you know, that this is in the world, right? That it's made and it's in the world is very important. This wouldn't work. This piece, if this was just this front panel on the wall, would be a very different piece, right? I love, love the materials and the pencil lines on it that sh sort of show the measuring and the tape on it. It's just sort of the, and the way they're weathered a little bit, as if they're found objects. And yet this is obviously something very painstakingly constructed with great precision. Right. So that also, right, these marks that, again, are kind of part of our shared psyche, right? We recognize these as the planning marks, right, as these are, mm -hmm. of course, you may have put these on later, right, to suggest that. We don't know. Right, but these are these kind of uh, planning, right, but they read that way. And yet it also adds, right, this really lovely, exciting, you know, from a purely formal point of view, right, we start to see this extra line here parallel to the, the actual scene. Yeah. 
I feel the blues tape is misleading. It's so well cut and assembled that he's, make, he's given the illusion that the tape needs to hold it together, but in really fact, it does not. Right, and I think that that's an interesting conflict in this piece, right? This, I, this. I, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe we should take the tape off. And see, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, see I assumed you used it to hold it together while the glue was drying, and that it never it, took it off. The lines on it, they, the pieces fit well. Right. The, the illusion that the, the tape's holding together is, I think, is Fallacy. Right. So well. But don't you think? I think the illusion is a part. What part of what like starts to make this piece, right, exciting? Yeah. Um, if you could not lean on the pedestal, sorry, my pedestals are not very steady. <laughs> not very steady. Um, but the fact is that the tape could have held it together. Right. You know, yeah. Right. So it probably. Well, but right. it also it could be that we're seeing it at a point of non-completion. It mm -hmm. may be that all that needs to happen next is for the tape to be. <laughs> right. It's very good because I, I think it is glued together and the tape actually held together. But, 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 uh, <laughs> but the psychology of behind it, which I, I couldn't explain or see myself in the mirror, but I felt like I'm sitting in like a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, everybody has identified certain aspects that just kind of, I mean, I wish every all artists could have you talk right. about their work. Because uh -huh. it really it's something that you don't see when you're in the studio. Mm -hmm. or right. Unless you bring it out into context, and you have like from your statement, you're having you need to have this dialogue right. with with the people who are looking at your work. Well, right. can I ask? Was your did you have a finished uh, vision in your mind that the piece would not have tape? This was actually part of a series, um, and this was a sort of a model that mm -hmm. I developed to, to do actually. Um, Use this as sort of like a how do you say it's like a like a mold, you know, to, to make some other pieces. But then I, I actually presented three three uh, pieces to the to the curator in the show, and, and I only chose one. <laughs> so this is like process. It's about the process that you go through. This is proof of what you start with, or something. Mm -hmm. And it's a piece unto it. It's a thing unto itself. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, I mean, artists do that. You know, they'll make a sketch or they'll have your your little uh, what, how do you say, your, your whiteboard or whatever mm -hmm. you've got yourself. You know, and those things have been in themselves suddenly become in your own minds these great pieces. You know? So this is really sort of study right. sketch, you know, for something else. I think. Yes. Much more aggressive than this. Right. Thank you. Yeah. What I find interesting is he said that was the mold. I know. Right, the finished product. Right. <laughs> you would think the finished product would be here rather than the mold. Yeah. You can see those on, you go to my website. But I just <laughs> <laughs> the statement that you made, it's, it's very true. A lot of your heart and soul goes into the yeah. mold and the design of it. It's tedious. Yeah. yeah. Well, I see this as a model, perhaps. Right. And um, uh, I mean, I happen to know just a little bit about Kit, but even if I didn't, I would see that as a model for a house, not unlike what an architect or a contractor would do. Um, but the tape is, for me, is comical because I can see that if he took the tape off and it wasn't glued, it would still hold together. So the, the tape at this point is superfluous, but but it, it, for me, it, it brings a bit of humor to it. Absolutely. I love this piece. I thought it was really funny. <laughs> and I actually think humor is actually w one of the most difficult things to do in art well. I think that that's something that I've seen a lot of artists struggle to do. Um, so I, I found this also to have both serious undertones and to be very funny. And of course, the most funny things often are. <laughs> Also, um, so yeah, I mean, these like weird blue band-aids. I mean, these are, you know, like, I mean, there's this weird, and I, I also, for me, without the blue tape, this wouldn't be successful, right? It's, it's, the blue tape is this very important, again, from a strictly formal point of view, the blue tape is, is really important. Those marks on this um, shape are what draws you to it. And had the tape been another color, it would have probably not worked as well. No, that's true. 
I, well, I like also, this blue. I don't know if it is the right the blue tape that I'm thinking of, but usually you use that kind of tape not to hold stuff together. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, it's right. Right. So, it's easy. not duct tape. It's, <laughs> it's not still duct tape. This tape is used yeah, it's like a paint tape. Painting. Yeah, it's yeah. painter's tape. So it's a misuse of something that, to me, accentuates how fragile it is. Uh, right. Because that tape's not as strong as tape that you should use mm -hmm. to hold the house together. <laughs> 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 Though I hope you're not holding your house together with it. <laughs> not that I haven't, but I hope they were not. Okay, great. I also wanted to take the chance, I saw several people um, standing with Sandra's piece, um, and I'm curious to apply this technique to um, what we might recognize as a more functional piece, or potentially more functional piece as well. So um, let's start again, thinking what, you know, what do we see in this piece? What's going on in this Saki. piece? Saki. So <laughs> we do, re and what makes you say that? Right. So we, we recognize, many of us right, recognize that this form is a specific form from a specific tradi tradition, so we recognize this form, right? Definitely. What else is going on in this piece? The painstaking artwork. Right. We really painting notice, painting. right, this, the, the technique and the, the, the craftsmanship. What else do we notice? What else do we see? I see an empty dress, a sake bottle, it looks like. This Right, you, you, we start to recognize, again, one of the things that's interesting, right, is that when we take um, functional objects and we present them in this context, right, gallery context, we're taking them out of the use in our, in our homes, out of our daily use, we begin to recognize them, right, again, as these more formal objects. We can add other readings to it so that we can really see this form, right, as this dress form or as this female form, right? I see the lines of, of the design as reflecting Mm -hmm. I see the, the drawn lines reflected in the shape of three-dimensional objects. Right. So right, and I think this very, both very delicate. Right. So we see both right a, a, a delicate of the porcelain as well as a delicate of the line, and we see right this repetition of the circle as well as the actual thin right this thin line is also repeated, not only in the shape but in this kind of edge, right that we see over and over again. Yes. What else um, do we see? Yeah. Well, if you're going to say that that is, if you're going to assign the value of that as like an empty dress or like a lonely form, and and both um, both the the holder and the cups have those same shapes, then there's like a relation between the two. So mm. it's like an implied family, like a single mother. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, well, you, you could see, but the, this is relational, right? Whether or not we're literal, that it's a family, these, this is relational, right? This is, is clearly relational. And this is a very set relationship. The, the, um, the decanter and the five cups, this is a set, uh, it's the standard set in, this, in the Japanese culture, right? So this is a very strict relationship. Oh, and, and, and seen as a full set, right? This, this is actually not a, a partial set in, in, in that culture. I, I liked the way you placed those two objects together. I think they speak to each other in right. an interesting mm -hmm. way. And you can imagine I move things around, so like, you know, that happens through this process of kind of thinking about um, where things are. Yeah, I couldn't separate the three because I know that's sake, but I wanted porcelain, so I wanted hot tea in it, in the house, <laughs> having a conversation <laughs> <laughs> right. of, of this conversation happening. Right. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry I didn't buy it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's definitely, other people have been sorry about it, too. Mm -hmm. You have to tell Sandra. <laughs> Okay, what time do we have? I mean, five twenty. Okay, great. So we have time for one more piece, and I'm trying to think about whose piece down at this end did I see? Did I see people standing at? Well, I want to do this piece over here. Kit, I saw you standing over here, and also I think this piece is, is in some ways a lot different than some of the other work. So I'm curious to try this technique with this piece as well. Have you, everybody seen this piece up close? It has a lot of little details and standing back doesn't work so well. <clears throat> so 
so kids get to go first. Um, <laughs> so um, the first question is, you know, what is going on in this picture? Well, when I was little, I loved cartoons and loved mm -hmm. drawing cartoons. So the, and it was a very intimate piece. You had to be like your nose right up to it. And it mm -hmm. was in contrast to all these other pieces, which I enjoy immensely. But it, um, and then the caricatures, you know, it was kind of an odd kind of a group, which, um, and I hadn't really looked at the title, so I just mm -hmm. looked at it, and it looked kind of like a disheveled sort of a family unit of some right. sort. Right. So what makes you say disheveled? Well, the way the character, I mean, it's a fine drawing. Someone's right. Someone's like, got, you know, got their nose in the paper, and they're, and they're detailed. And they're, right. They have a sense that, well, there's some exaggeration in the face. Right. The eyes. Right. You see these kind of like... Right, these kind of very, both oversized, but also somewhat sagging eyes. This kind of talks to this disheveledness. We also see this, posture. right, this posture. Talks about this disheveledness. We also talk, you say like a family group, right, in which we see by the, right, this clustering, right, is part of how we start to read. These, these are associated with each other. They're not at odds with each other. They're associated with each other in some way, right? And that, and that they all... Not like they're at a bus stop where there are people unrelated. It, it, you know, it's like you're saying it's it's one. Thing. But we, we we do recognize that there's some relationship, right? We, we probably a familiar relationship, but right, these, these they're related. They're not just like five random people standing together. And we see that because of the positioning of the figures in relationship to each other, right? They're they're crowding on each other, but it's not rejected, <laughs> right? We don't see a rejection of that. What else do we see? Right, so we have this one figure right at the end, right? We see this kind of right, this gesture, this reach out, right? It's curious that it's a, I mean, I read it as a family also, and not one of the bigger or maybe parental or older right. we, we, that's calling for help. Right, it's almost like the littlest guy in the line is the one who's like reaching out, right? That's reaching out to us, right? Who's, who's associating with, with us where the others are kind of. Normally, so. it's you know it's got a big mat around it, a thin black frame. You've got this nice sort of dark, uh, uh, sort of abstract rectangle, right? Set with these white sort of triangular shapes leading to the to the top. Mm -hmm. It's sort of offset almost from here. It almost looks like a group of buildings. Right, and I actually think that's an interesting read. Right, this kind of like right, we just we this again right this really structural thing. And you can draw it into it, and it's, and it's very you know the fact that there's the big mat and there's a white around the space. Of the Right. To talk to you about it. And I do think this is important for all of you artists and aspiring artists that you know thinking about how you present your work really does change how it's understood. You know, it really does make a big difference. And in this piece, you know, this actually helps. This piece, you know, right, helps this piece. This this larger white ground does exaggerate the, this nature of this isolated group, right? Yeah, right. Right. We really recognize kind of this cartoon tradition, but a, particularly like a, a somewhat grim and cynical uh, cartoon tradition with a little twist of humor. Right. This little. Um, so we, we recognize that right away, definitely. Um, and also, what's fun about this? So again, from a curatorial surprise, a juror's surprise, that it turns out that uh, this artist was a as a uh, eighteen year old. Uh, artists. And her grandmother, I accidentally, unknowingly, because I don't know anybody in town yet, I exhibited on the same wall. <laughs> so like these little um, accidental surprises that happen because, again, I, I, you know, I don't know that I would have chosen them on purpose if I had known that, right? But, you know, these kind of sweet connections that happen organically um, in terms of starting to see work and that I chose to put them on the same wall is something that I've been kind of thinking about back and forth. And I also think it's interesting when I hear Kit say, and I think many of us, that, um, you know, this drawing we do read as a, an 18-year-old's drawing. Right, that, you know, this is a type of drawing. So, like, it's interesting that sh that you say this is something I did when I was. But of course, she is, and she is, and it's wonderful, <laughs> and it's wonderful, right? So this, this. Um, so I think I, I'm curious to add that to the conversation as well. Um, I think this, this best quality is how this walk frame is very tiny, light dark, 
right that yep. you know bum, bum, bum. right no it, right it, it oh, exaggerates yeah. that perspective yeah. right it really exaggerates very, that very right it but really it's also interesting what you mentioned that this is you know related there there is a, an underlying tone of the same sense of Humor. Right, you know, and like this, focus. right, and also this, yes, right, exactly. the, right, this, Focusing and scale. Line. So it's interesting, and I, I definitely didn't know that. And they were so delighted when they came in and discovered right. they were on the same right. wall, which was very uh, a sweet pleasure of the of the opening for me. Um, so um, thank you all for uh, going through this process with me and experimenting with visual thinking strategies with me, and. Um, please come back to future events. We have Brian uh, Campbell's show coming up on November 9th. And it's really exciting, and you should come. <laughs> and his talk will be the 28th of November. And if you need a little slip to remind you, there are um, little cheat sheets over here. <laughs> OK, and thank you so much. <laughs>